So one of my favorite Saturday Night Live skits of the pandemic uh, involved a fortune teller, Madame Vivelda, played by Kate McKinnon. A group of friends decides to visit a fortune teller at the end of 2019, and they happily babble about trips to Paris and work promotions they're hoping for in 2020. Instead, though, they're perplexed when Madame Vivelda shares visions of washing bags of Doritos with soap, traveling to Kentucky by car with the urinal jug to avoid pit stops, and the group of friends disowning one of their own for an unspeakable act, dining inside a restaurant. <laughs> After hearing these strange predictions about 2020, the friends leave unsettled and decide this fortune teller is just a little too weird. Or, here's that weird in real life. A friend of mine had early access to COVID vaccination last winter as a healthcare worker, and she snagged an appointment at her employer in Northwest DC on the afternoon of January 6th. But she lives straight east of the city in Prince George's County, and some events that transpired at the Capitol that day made it difficult for her to get to her appointment. So she had to reschedule. She told me later that as she explained to her husband what was going on, it was one of those moments where you hear the words coming out of your mouth and you realize how preposterous they sound. Honey, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it to my appointment for the antidote to the global pandemic because of the insurrection happening in our nation's capital. Weird and disheartening times. But although most of us have gotten so used to life since the coronavirus showed up, if we take a step back, we remember how weird 2020 and 2021 have been. If any of us had heard these anecdotes shared in 2019, we may have thought it was a movie, possibly a movie about the end times. I start here because we have, fittingly, a weird scripture passage for this first Sunday of Advent. As America revolves from pumpkins and turkeys to Santas and jingle bells and white Christmas in stores everywhere, as families begin to pull out wreaths and hot cocoa and sweet images of holy baby Jesus who doesn't cry, we come to church and we get end times and apocalypse as the secular season that I'll call Fun Advent tries to fill up our bellies with chocolate and wine calendars and our minds with cheery shopping lists and photos of happy families on our fridge, we come to church and we get distress and fear and foreboding and the powers of the heavens being shaken. That's weird. But, as I said, the times we've been living in are weird, too, and if we have any hope of wrapping our minds around the full weirdness of Advent, any hope of understanding this earth-shattering idea that Jesus has come into the world and is still coming, this is probably the year for us to grasp it. In our honest moments, most of us would probably admit that fun Advent is both a little exhausting and a little disappointing. Don't get me wrong, I am fully on board with Fun Advent, with a kid who, for the first time this year, is old enough to get excited and learn traditions. I have a bag of tricks in my closet at the ready to pull out this afternoon and start pulling out candles and books and songs and ornaments and nativity scenes. But I also know that all these things, as much as we love them, have a habit of leaving us unfulfilled, wanting something more. After all, babies, even baby Jesus, cry. Smiles can mask sorrow, gifts can disappoint, full calendars can leave us feeling empty. Which is why we need what I'm going to call weird Advent, too. In some ways, um, Advent derives from the Latin word that means coming, and it has a double meaning for the church each December. So yes, we prepare our hearts for the coming of baby Jesus into the world, 
God entering our world naked and vulnerable in our time of need. And that story in its own right is frankly weird and earth shattering too. So we read about Mary, who's less of a sweet girl and more of a quiet revolutionary than tradition may suggest. We read about John the Baptist, who's a weird desert dweller who eats locusts. We read about angels who always announce themselves with the words, do not fear. So maybe they are less like these beautiful throngs of light and more like a terrifying heavenly being coming down in power with urgent messages. And we read about a baby in whom the fullness of God dwells. Again, that story in its own right is earth-shattering and weird. But in case we lose the weirdness and the power of it in the familiarity, the church also uses this time to ponder a second advent, a second coming of God into the world. It's that time that we hope for, that time when the world change that began in Jesus' lifetime comes into full fulfillment, a time when the powers of the heavens will be shaken and God's full justice and salvation will arrive, a time of apocalypse or unveiling. And that is why in Advent we also read about Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of God, the return of the Son of Man. That is why we read today that we are to be alert, on guard, prayerful. And Jesus' words in Luke today are drawn from the long Hebrew tradition of end times and apocalypse. The prophet Isaiah spoke of that day when the heavens would tremble and the earth would be shaken. Daniel experienced night visions of a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. The prophet Jeremiah spoke of the chaotic roaring of the sea as the day of judgment from Babylon approached. So while these descriptions seem pretty far out to us today, they maybe wouldn't have sounded quite so weird to the original hearers, to a people living in injustice, in fear of foreign military takeovers. The day of the Lord was always a way of speaking of that longed for liberation. When you are highly dissatisfied by the status quo, when you are oppressed, That scary, earth-shaking day sounds more like a good thing. Now, exactly what did Jesus mean when he spoke of this day coming near? Did he mean to suggest that earthly history was reaching its end and that God's heavenly realm of peace was about to begin? Or was the coming of the Son of Man to be understood as a political reality in which a Messiah leader would usher in a reign of such justice and righteousness that it could only be understood as a total break from the past? Or did Jesus speak of the kingdom of God in a more symbolic way, knowing that his impending death and resurrection would initiate that kingdom of God? Or was it some combination of all of these? To be honest, I don't fully know. I'm just as confused by about anyone of what to do with weird Advent and what to do with apocalyptic Jesus sometimes. In some ways, it can be simpler to just think of it as a supernatural day in the future when Jesus will come to sweep us off to some other realm, especially if pandemic seems unending. Did anyone else just read about the Omicron variant this weekend? Or if grief seems too much here. Well, one day the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of God is going to blow it all up and start over. According to a Pew Research survey from 2010, I was surprised to learn that 43% of Americans thought Jesus would definitely or probably return to earth by 2050. And it was not only among evangelicals and other Christians that this view was prevalent, but fully 19% of religiously unaffiliated folks were expecting Jesus to come back, too. 
In some ways, it's simpler to think of it as that day in the future, but nuance here is probably more helpful. Theologians speak of an already but not yet of God's kingdom. That is, that Jesus' life and death and resurrection ushered in a whole new reality so that ever since Jesus was raised from the dead, God's kingdom has already begun. And at the same time, we are still so far from that experience of justice and shalom wholeness. God's kingdom is not yet fully realized. In that sense, we are still waiting for Jesus to return and make it all whole. And I yearn for that wholeness and reunion with God that remains elusive in our world as it is. Whether that will look like a literal Jesus on the clouds or some other cataclysmic breaking of God into our world, I don't know. But what I do know is that with the weirdness of this year in mind, it's starting to be a lot easier to relate to the disciples who were talking to Jesus here, anxiously asking him about the end times. So just prior to this passage, they've asked him about his comment that the temple would be torn down. When will it happen, they want to know. What will be the signs? It's in this context that Jesus begins to teach about the coming of the Son of Man. And what strikes me today is that Jesus really is speaking words of comfort to those who are experiencing scary and uncertain times. Perhaps he sees the fear and grief in their eyes, the temple gone, the earth shaken, and he reminds them that for those who follow the way of Jesus, this is good news. When these things begin to take place, Jesus says, stand up, and raise your heads, for your redemption is drawing near. And again, later he says, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. For those who follow Jesus, we are not to be dismayed by signs of the world being turned upside down. We are to stand up, raise our heads, and look for the kingdom of God. It's when things are breaking down that redemption is coming. It's when apocalypse is happening that Jesus is on his way back to bind up all our wounds, make all things new. This is true for that ultimate day when the kingdom of God is fully realized and we are all healed and reunited to the ones we've lost and to the God our souls long for. But there are also little apocalypses, little unveilings happening all the time these days. Pandemic has unveiled a lot of things. The reality of our healthcare inequities, how overworked teachers and healthcare workers and those in the service and industry really are. That January attempt to overthrow a legitimately elected government unveiled the depth of misinformation in our society and the toxic pandering within our government, the murder of a black man by police in Minneapolis has shaken at least some of white America out of complacency with a severely broken system. I'd even suggest that the capital C church, the larger church in our nation, is experiencing an unveiling of its own where some old ways of doing things have ceased to work post-pandemic and are in need of refreshing new forms. And what about personal unveilings, like when crisis reveals the need for healing in a relationship, or when the depth of one's depression makes it clear that just getting by won't cut it anymore, that help is needed? In all of those little unveilings, could the kingdom of God be coming near? Could Jesus be inviting us to raise up our heads and look for redemption? To be clear, it's not the inequity or the crisis that has any redeeming value. It's not that when things are unveiled, we have an opportunity to change our ways and choose another path forward. Rather, what Jesus seems to be saying is that when you see these signs, it has already begun. 
The kingdom of God is already coming near. Raise up your head, Jesus says, because history is already in motion. Once the fig tree has sprouted leaves, there's no going back. Summer is just around the corner. There will be fruit. Once the powers that be are shaken, there will be fruit for the kingdom of God. So whatever is shaken in your personal life, whatever systems you see shaken around the world, Jesus is already moving there. He's too powerful not to. And it's not all on your shoulders. So don't be weighed down with the worries of this life. Rather, stay alert. Raise up your heads in hope and look for the coming of Jesus. Not sweet little baby Jesus, but powerful, earth-shattering Jesus Christ, the one who shatters the proud and casts the mighty from their thrones and lifts up the lowly. Does anyone recognize those last words? The one who shatters the proud and casts the mighty from their thrones and lifts up the lowly. While it sounds like a description of that heaven-shaking son of man coming on the cloud, it's a reminder that this Jesus is one and the same with the baby who was born. Because those words about God shattering the proud and lifting up the lowly were spoken by Mary, meek and mild Mary, as she prepared to give birth to a humble and quiet little baby Jesus. So we began at the end of times, but now we're back to the beginning, to that baby who is coming to start a revolution of hope in a weary world. It's an invitation. This Advent season, rather than play escape from the world we're living in, we can take the encouragement of Jesus and amid all the weird signs, we can look for the fruit of the kingdom of God. We can look for the radical inbreaking of Jesus, of God with us in our world. I'll go first. This week, I saw a nearly all-white jury in Georgia hold three murders of a black man to account. That's a start. What have you seen? What might we see together this Advent as we raise up our heads and look around in preparation for the God who always promises to come? <laughs>